to another edition of the Heart and Healthcare Report. Today we have Sybil, who's with Heart and Sleep Disorder Center with us. Thanks for having being here with us today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. We'll be back after these commercials with Sybil's presentation. There's one place women of all ages can find the care they need. The Women's Center at Hartman Regional Medical Center. We're a full-service women's center with comprehensive obstetrical and gynecological surgery. Our excellent customer satisfaction rate is a reflection of our commitment to excellence. To serve you even better, we've now remodeled our facility. Our family-friendly birth center features private labor, delivery, and recovery suites. For every stage of your life, we're there for you. The Women's Center at Hartman Regional Medical Center. We're proud of our uh, sleep lab here at Harton. We are the longest established accredited sleep center of the area. We started in 1991 on the second floor of our facility. We used one patient room and we changed it into one patient bedroom and slash control room for the technician. And that was in 1991, and then we progressed in 93. We moved to the Jackson Medical Building, and we were a two-bedroom lab. Very proud of that. Now we are located across from the Tractor Supply Company, and we have a four-bed facility. And we keep it pretty busy, and we're very pleased and proud of it. Uh, a nice facility. We welcome any of you to come by and walk through and we'll show you what we've got, what we have to offer. There's two ways that you can come see us. You can come by self-referral and just call our number and we will schedule an appointment for a consultation with our physician. Or you can uh, go through your family practitioner and get a referral if you want to. Before you ever come in our doors, we always... Um, verify the insurance and any coverage. So there's no question, if you have a question about the coverage of the procedures, just ask us and we will be able to tell you. Because uh, we always make sure that that's taken care of before anyone comes in. Um, I've been here at Hart for 23 years. It's a fine place to work. We have some great doctors, as I'm sure Stephanie's already told you. Uh, we have a great team of people that work over at the sleep lab. We try to, to consider everybody's feelings from the time they walk in that door till the time they leave. And we have a, a suggestion sheet for anything that needs to be corrected or anything that needs to be changed in any way. But I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about sleep. And I, like I said, I wasn't prepared for this, and I know you all can't see that, but this kind of helps me to remember what I need to probably say. This is an example of a normal night's sleep. And of course, we all know it's always different. But typically, we look for stage one, two, three, and REM sleep. I know you've all heard of REM sleep, the rapid eye sleep. Now, that's restorative sleep. Some people never get there. But if we do have a normal night's sleep, it would look something like this. The little dark spots are the REM sleep. Our REM sleep will start usually about 60, 90 minutes after we fall asleep. And then each REM period will get a little bit longer. The first one may only be 5 to 10 minutes. Then it may get a little bit longer and a little bit longer. Uh, if you don't have that sleep, you are not going to wake up the next morning refreshed. You're going to feel groggy. You, you may have headaches. You may be irritable, hard to get along with. Uh, and some people sleep, they think they sleep fine, and they don't know why they feel miserable. They, just, they, just, they thought they had a good night's sleep. They just don't really realize what can go on during that sleep. But a typical sleep, you're going to have all those stages. You may have a few arousals. You may have uh, a desat and some of your oxygen, but nothing that's going to disturb you. Uh, other than that... What we, can get in, what we can get into, I'm sorry, is, I know it's going to be hard to see, but we have, the yellow lines are what we call apneas. If you can see, I know the people in front might be able to see, you've got a wavy pattern there, and then it gets kind of flat. Up on the top, the blue shows us arousals. The blue is the arousals. That orange is snoring. Sometimes you will have snoring and arousals, and you'll have these epics of not breathing. Your oxygen level can, can even drop down into the 50s. Scary. These people wake up the next morning, they're out on the road driving. Maybe a truck driver driving next to you. Or the person who's driving and you're the passenger. This is what we find. Now, if this is bad enough, while we're doing our test, 
we try to treat them all in one night to change this. If it is an apnea where you stop the breathing, then we can use what a small mask, either kind of like a cannula. You've all seen that when you go visit people. I sell one here. Um, or a, a nasal mask or a full face mask. What goes through this is just continuous positive airway pressure. Now, if needed, you can bleed oxygen through that, but it's basically just continuous air, and it acts as a splint, and it keeps your airway patent so that you don't have these episodes. People come in, and when we treat them with this, they wake up the next morning, and we have had some people say they haven't felt this good in 20 years because what they were doing all night long was having these little episodes. This is... This is a five-minute tracing of a patient. The yellow shows you one episode after another. All the little blue places and the orange places up there are showing the arousals and the um, snoring. This will prevent you to get into the nice, deep delta and REM sleep. And when you don't get that, there's no way you can feel refreshed the next morning. It's... Uh, it's it's really an interesting job, and it's very rewarding when you take somebody. Let me see if you can see that. You probably won't be able to see that too well. But all these dark places at the beginning of this tracing, this is a split study. This is the patient desatting down probably in the 60s. At this point here where that yellow starts, we are treating the patient with the CPAP mask. This dark area goes away because the patient is no longer desatting down to the 50s and 60s. They're not having the apneas where they're not breathing. They're not having as many arousals, and they are feeling refreshed when they get up the next morning. Um, and we, as we all know, there's enough problems to deal with every day in our lives without something like this can be corrected very, very easily. It's just a matter of coming in and being diagnosed and having it addressed. Um, as we age, things change a little bit. Uh, our sleeping patterns, uh, we lose some of our deep sleep anyway, but we will increase a lot of times with, everybody's seen the advertisements for all the restless legs that's very prevalent with renal failure, um, some medications. Uh, that can be just as devastating as arousals from the awakenings, the brain waves. Time and time again, it's not uncommon to see restless legs that just every few seconds, there's no way you're going to get into a deep sleep again because of all these uh, interruptions. Um, hygiene plays a big part in the way we sleep. If you're going to drink your tea and your coffee late in the afternoon, that stays in our system for up to eight hours. People don't realize that. Our recommendation is to kind of wean off of anything caffeinated after, before noon. You drink that before noon and, and drink whatever you want that's decaf in the afternoon. Uh, you may, a lot of people say, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me, that doesn't keep me up. Uh, I'm a sleep tech, registered tech. Believe me, I see that, I know it does. Um, uh, let's see. I can't think of what else I want to say. Um, yes, ma'am. I realize that if I don't have caffeine after one o'clock in the afternoon, he doesn't snore as much. Because I'm, I'm sleeping. <laughs> well, and, and, and yes, and I understand that. And one of our best referrals to the sleep lab is a spouse. <laughs> And then sometimes, though, um, and our doctor does, if possible, request that the spouse, if you have a sleeping partner, to come in with you. A lot of information can be learned that way. And uh, sometimes we find out that maybe it's not that the spouse is keeping you. Maybe you're the one with the problem, and the spouse is okay, too. So, you know, you never know until you start talking to people how many things are going on. But, but and a TV in the room, it and people want to fall asleep and watch TV, they don't realize that just the uh, soft light from the TV and the noise from the TV, some people use it as a filter to drown out other noises. But at the same time, these noises 
can be arousing you up a little at a time, a little at a time, and preventing you from going into you, your cycle of sleep that you really need. Um, I have had people to come in, and we've done a, a diary and tried to wean off the TV being in the room, and they find out actually that they, they feel more refreshed because they did get a deeper sleep after they listened and tried to get those if, if you want something to deter uh, the outside noise or ex anything that might would wake you up, a uh, white noise or a noisemaker like that or an ocean sound, something like that is more advisable than a TV. Um, but our, our routine and, and, of course, alcohol, a lot of people have a drink or two before they go to bed. And what you need to realize, too, that that will help you a lot of times go to bed. But once you wake up, your sleep is going to be more disturbed. It's like a pill or anything else that you take. It's, it's only good for a short time. Then you'll have the effects of what you've done. Um, eating? Uh, well, eating, uh, you should eat before at least two hours Try to have your meal over with. Uh, you'd be surprised people that try to eat late and go to bed and they think it doesn't bother them, but it does. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why do we sleep different depending on how you lay? The back or the side? Uh, sleep yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but, but we do, when we're doing our study, we do uh, watch and monitor whether you're sleeping on your side or your back or your front. And most of us, if we have like the sleep apnea, we will be worse on our back. And that's because the airway gets shut off more likely because you're on your back and, and the fatty tissues will just absolutely close it. If you go on your side, you could be right, you could be a lot better. And we do have a lot of people that we um, asked uh, that they try like uh, positional therapy. Uh, we can, back years ago, they used to sew tennis balls in a t-shirt. Well, we have belts now that you can use with built-in uh, devices so that when you roll over on your back, it'll disturb your sleep and it won't feel so comfortable so that you'll roll back on your side. Then that way people, and it's very successful, some people can use that and obtain a full night's sleep without interruption. Yes, ma'am. If you're on a CPAP machine, can you lay on your back? Sir, sure. Well, if you're on the CPAP system, that is our goal when we're doing the treatment portion of the test. Uh, the technician is out there watching uh, throughout every uh, step of the way. We change the pressures from four to, you know, they go up quite high. It can go up to 17. Then if you can't do uh, that, we have even by level where we have two different levels for in inspiratory and expiratory that we use. But that is our gold standard is to get somebody titrated without any sleep apnea, no desaturations of uh, oxygen below 90 uh, in the supine position on your back in REM. That's the gold standard. That's, that's what we work for every time we do a procedure. Yes, ma'am. Well, we say no, no closer than two hours before bedtime. We really, it would, be, it would be better to do it even, you know, about four hours beforehand because that's, that lays heavy on you, and it's, it's just a stimulant, too, just like anything else that we do. Yes, ma'am. Yes, if, if you're on CPAP and you start snoring was the question, uh, do they need to come back in and, and see the doctor? Um, a lot of times, uh, just an office visit to follow up, can, he can find out exactly what's wrong. Sometimes they ask if it's been several years to maybe repeat the study to find out. But chances are, if that's the case, maybe you've may, had a weight gain change, which happens to us over the years. That is a, a big factor in the snoring starting again. I wasn't pointing to anybody. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Keep it in the family, right? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. You were measuring the pressure of the CPAP. You say from 4 to 17. What are the units of that pressure? Pounds per square inch, I know it's not that high, but what's the units of the pressure? You know, I can't tell you that. I'm, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure. I don't know how to answer that. I'm just. I'm. Yes, ma'am. There, that's called a uh, REM behavior disorder. REM behavior disorder, this happens when you get to your REM sleep. It is more prevalent in men than it is in women. And that happens as we age. And some people can be super strong when this happens. They can do things that they wouldn't be able to do. Okay, well... There, that's one thing about sleep. It's always interesting. There's, there's no set rules. I'm just trying to tell you the norm. <laughs> uh, I, I would suggest you come visit Dr. Phelps and let him have a conversation with you. <laughs> yes. In, in the REM, that's why we call in REM, everything is relaxed. Uh, and that's when you should, should be... I figure I'm waking up and my body has not relaxed. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. If you start bleeding while somebody is sleeping, and they start bleeding for maybe a second, is that dangerous? Well, we call uh, an apnea is 10 seconds. So if it's less than that, we're not too worried about it. But it's just that when it happens over and over and over throughout the night, which it very well can, and that's when we try to do like a split study. We have, we used to have a criteria that we had to wait two hours before we did uh, the treatment part with the mask that we were talking about. Now they have changed the rules and the laws, and we are able to uh, treat somebody after we've demonstrated uh, a hypopnea index of 10, which... Sometimes we we know right quick, okay, get the stuff ready. We're going to have to start fitting this patient with a mask and see what's going to fit. And we do, by the way, have different sizes and, and all different kinds of them. So whatever we find, we can find one that's comfortable for each person's face. But, yes, um, th that's when it's it's serious, when it happens more than a second. We we can all just kind of stop a little bit. But when it's more than 10 seconds, that's when we call, call it an apnea. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I had a friend that was in his 30s and found out with his sleep apnea problems that his um, tonsils need to be taken Correct. Down. Is that a thing that's going on? Yes. We, we, yes. I guess because I'm talking to older folks, I didn't think about that angle, but yes. <laughs> We, uh, different facilities will see babies. I've worked in places that, that dealt with uh, infants. They do sleep studies on, on little ones. But our lab, we start at five years old. That's what the, the doctor feels is uh, we're accustomed to that. Uh, but yes, that's very prevalent. Uh, and we actually have uh, ENTs that will refer patients to the sleep center for evaluation to find out what's going on. And if it is just the tonsils, then we don't go any further with them, but uh, sometimes we find that even in small children, and of course, um, especially with uh, obesity and our children are staying inside more, working with the electronic games, and they're not outside playing and running like they should be, and we see it more prevalent in the young people too, which is quite scary, but that's what we try to do is we try to catch them when they're young so that this won't carry on through the rest of their lives. No, that's that's something else. That's uh, right, right. Yes, ma'am. Should a person consider having a sleep study done on them if they have a lot of nights when they can't go to sleep and they won't get but just spending three hours of sleep? Three hours of sleep is not uh, sufficient for anyone. Yes, if you're going to do this continually, you need to come in for an evaluation because it's going to take its toll on you. And uh, just like, um, you know, I mean, you can be driving down the road. You can fall asleep at a red light. You can fall asleep and somebody thinking, well, they're going to go. It's got a green light now. And they can run right into you because you weren't doing what you was expected to do. Nobody needs to. People think, and I hear people all the time, oh, I can go on four hours of sleep all the time. No, it's going to catch up with you. Yes. Certainly. 
certainly. We have we've had people come in that's lost 50 pounds, 30 pounds, come in for a reevaluation. Sometimes the pressure needs to be reduced. Sometimes that can come off of it altogether. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Well, uh, I, I would say that you would have you and your spouse would have to be the judge of that. Sometimes uh, a quick little nap doesn't hurt any of us. But if your afternoon nap turns into a two-hour procedure, uh, then it can affect your sleeping at night. If you find you're going to bed at night and you can't sleep well, I would try to uh, force myself to stay awake and not have that nap and see if I didn't do better. Yes. It, it, it's different with the, every person. I can't say that. Uh, sometimes we can see the right, sometimes the left. It's, it doesn't matter. She asked, she said she'd read that it's better to sleep on your right side because it's closer to the heart. But we see people that have uh, DSATs and apneas at, in different positions. Well, listen to Dr. Oz first. I'm not the doctor. <laughs> I'm still I'm still a progress learning, not as you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then go to bed and can't sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, but that's because if you'd have gone to bed to begin with and started your cycle there it would have progressed into a better night's sleep. But, well, <laughs> well, I'm not out of the kitchen yet at 7 o'clock, Stephanie. <laughs> you got two daughters to help you get cleaned up from the kitchen. Yeah. But that's another thing, too, uh, that people don't realize, and maybe some of you do. Um, some people can't even have a clock in their bedroom. The illumination that's from the clock, the light will bother them. Other people, I mean, a, an electrical storm could be going outside and everything else going on and nothing's gonna bother them. But in reality, it's been proven that light will bother your sleep. Just like every now and then, my husband will turn the light on and then I throw the blanket up over my head and he's like, what's wrong with you? It's like, I'm trying to sleep, you know? <laughs> now, if you, if, that's why night lights will help. If you if you got to get up and walk around, of course we don't want to fall. You know you got to have enough light to see where you're going. But if you're going to turn on every light in the room before you get to cross the to the kitchen, then by the time you get back, your brain is going to be sitting on ready to get up. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I thought you were going to say and you didn't sleep well here and I was going to say hospital's not the place to get your rest <laughs> we want to get you well but it's not a place to sleep <laughs> yes ma'am So you believe what I'm saying, the light bothers you, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> no, I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I, I can't tell you for sure if there's like a medical reason. Like I said, book your appointment with Dr. Phelps and he'll help you with that. But there are, and, and we it's documented, there are people who have nightmares, children with night terrors, and uh, it's, it's a very real thing, yes. So don't take it lightly. I can't tell you medically what the cause is. But do believe that it can happen. Yes, I've seen I've seen clips of it from different patients. Uh, it's very, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, uh, there are some people that take more uh, work to try to help them to get desensitized to things. And uh, sometimes we just tell people to wear the mask even around the house, you know, just 20 minutes at a time, just to try to get used to it because some people are a little claustrophobic and it bothers them. Um, once you learn that it can't hurt you, sometimes it's, that helps. But uh, there are exceptions to everything. But when you see how bad things can look and when you desat down to 60s and 50s and you don't get your sleep cycle that you need, it, it can take years off of our life and it can cause problems throughout our, you know, day. That it, It's worth trying to, to try to correct it, but I understand that some people do have a difficult time with it. And a lot of times when they do, they come in and we try to work with them and uh, try different masks and let you sit there with the pressure and try to find out what the problems are. We have those. We have those, ma'am. No. No, 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 no. That We've had those for years. And if you've not tried one of those, you might want to come by and we'll see what we can do for you. <laughs> well, you know where we're located, right? <laughs> and I'll leave some cards back here. If anybody's interested, they can pick up some cards and be able to get a hold of us. Is there another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, it, everybody's different. There's one place women of all ages can find the care they need. The Women's Center at Hartman Regional Medical Center. We're a full-service women's center with comprehensive obstetrical and gynecological surgery. Our excellent customer satisfaction rate is a reflection of our commitment to excellence. To serve you even better, we've now remodeled our facility. Our family-friendly birth center features private labor, delivery, and recovery suites. For every stage of your life, we're there for you. The Women's Center at Hartman Regional Medical Center. Sybil, thanks for being here with us today. I think this is a topic everybody enjoyed. And we'll be back next month with another edition of the Heart and Healthcare Report.